Let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10 this evening. Nehemiah chapter 10. The people have uh, prayed to God. They had admitted his blessings to them, and they confessed their sins, and now they've resolved to restore uh, the land and the nation to serving the Lord. Let's read the last verse of chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 38 first. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Now, chapter 10, verses 1 through 27. Long list of names here, so pray for me. <laughs> now, those that sealed were Nehemiah the Tershitha, which seems to be also the title for the governor over the people. The son of Hakaliah and Zidkijah, Seraiah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malkijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Maluk, Harim, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, Mejamin, Meaziah, Bilgai, Shimeiah, these were the priests. And the Levites, both Jeshua the son of Azaniah, Benui of the sons of Hinnadad, Cadmiel, and their brethren, Shebaniah, Hodijah, Kelida, Peleah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zakur, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodijah, Benai, Benuni, uh, Beninu, uh, the chief of the people, Harash, Pahath, Moab, Elam, Zathu, Benai, Buni, Asgad, Bebei, Adonijah, Bigbei, Aden, Ater, uh, Hizkijah, Hizkijah, Azur, uh, Hodijah, Hashem, Bezei, Harif, Anathoth, Nebei, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezir, Meshezabiel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Anaya, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashab, Halohesh, Peliha, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabna, Maasiah, and Ahijah, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Haram, Baana. All right, we'll stop there. There's a good list of possible baby names for any expectant mother. She's not sure what to name her, <laughs> her future child. Um, uh, when the Bible speaks of someone sealing a document, the standard practice was by using a signet ring, a ring that had the uh, design of that person's name or their occupation on the front of it. And run forward real quickly to the next book, the book of Esther, Chapter 3, Esther 3, and verse 12 comments on this process. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, was it written and sealed with the king's ring. Uh, this document, so uh, this document um, would have uh, hot wax uh, dripped onto it, and then the person would impress the symbol on his ring into the wax to make it official. And of course the wax would cool before much longer. But these uh, signatories, notice verse 14, the chief of the people, Parash, Peath, Moab, Elam, Zatu, Benai, and so forth, um, only represented the rest of the nation. Look at uh, verse 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, and so forth. This covenant uh, that they enter into was a public document. You know, the Lord believes in public commitment to him. Go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus 32. 
And here Moses receives the law, and he comes back down and finds the people have uh, forsaken uh, and grown impatient and are made an idol with the help of Aaron uh, and are dancing, it around, dancing around it. And notice Exodus 32, verses 25 and 26. And when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And in the New Testament, go forward, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Chapter 10. Moses wanted to separate those who were going to be true to God and those who weren't sure or weren't going to. Matthew chapter 10. Notice what Christ says here in verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Now, let's continue reading verses 28 to 31. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his judgments and his statutes, and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals, I don't know if that's pronounced victuals or victuals, on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Also we made, no, 31, that's where I want to stop right there. Notice, first of all, the Jews who entered into this covenant separated themselves, according to verse 28. Separation is a Bible doctrine in any age, from the, the wickedness and the, the works of the flesh in the world around you. <clears throat> the Bible says that Christ himself was separate from sinners in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 26. And Paul commands the New Testament believers to come out from among them, that is, the ungodly and the unsaved, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. But you have to be careful putting the uh, idea of separation into practice. There are some people who are separated from many uh, carnal trappings. Think of certain uh, nuns, priests, monks, members of certain cults, um, and yet they're characterized, as Jude says, quote, being sensual, not having the spirit. Jude, verse 9. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were very separated from uncleanness. Uh, meanwhile, they were planning how to murder Jesus Christ at the same time. Some people's separation is only for outward show. Think of Jehovah's Witnesses. They claim to be separated from certain things. Christmas, birthdays, I'm sure they would say they're separated from anything that's uh, pornographic and filthy. Um, separated from a loyalty to the country. They won't join the military and uh, defend the nation in which they live because they, don't, they say they don't want to give their loyalty to another kingdom that might be in conflict with Jehovah's kingdom um, at any time. And yet I've known many of them who are up to speed and up to date on the most recent Hollywood TV shows and movies, and uh, they enjoy their liquor as much as anyone else. Uh, whether it's uh, foolish spending of their money, they know all the sports teams, the sports athletes, 
and the personal lives of their favorite celebrities and sports uh, stars. And they want all the religious tax benefits uh, from a country that they don't want to defend. So, and think of Catholic priests. They stay unmarried, ostensibly, so that they can give their lives to devotion and devotion to Christ's true church. But at the same time, I've, at my day job, I'll make this personal, at my day job in the funeral business, I've driven the funeral hearse with Catholic priests riding with me back and forth to the cemetery. And I have had them volunteer the fact that they uh, enjoy a cigar and a brandy and watch porno pornography and dirty movies in their apartments. Um, and, and they swear like, many of them can swear like a sailor. Uh, many of them have uh, smoking problems, uh, smoking habits, drinking habits. Um, and their, their abuse of children and their worldwide pedophile scandals have rocked the world recently. So there's a lot of uh, hypocrisy going on uh, with people who claim to be separated from all the, world, the worst trappings they think someone could be engaged in. And there are some believers who go overboard in their separation practices as well. To specify the accepted hairstyle or the uh, uh, accepted haircut, the dress code, the length of the girl's skirt, the types of fingernail polish they should wear, or if they are allowed to wear any at all, um, what kind of makeup or so forth on their face. My dad used to say, every old barn needs a new coat of paint from time to time. And uh, I remember in Bible school, Dr. Ruckman said, you know, Christian girls want to be separate from the world, and they don't want to uh, be seen as uh, being flirtatious or uh, overly interested in attracting uh, boys. He says, but, but you know, you got to get something started somewhere. So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't against girls uh, or ladies putting on a, a touch of makeup here to, if it's going to help and accentuate the positive, it's fine. Um, and, but simply he'll get very carried away um, in restricting uh, certain sports, certain leisure activities, monitoring church members who have a television set and whether or not they go to the movies and so forth and get very carried away. It's not enough to be separated from certain things. Uh, a Christian has to be separated to something better. Go in the case of Paul, look at Romans chapter 1. Romans And Romans 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. That's what he was now concerned with. In the proclamation, the preaching of the gospel, wherever God would lead him, whatever door would open to him, whatever person was put in his path. And let me... Move on here. Next, notice that the people entered into a curse, as it says in verse 29, which pretty well sums up much of the Old Testament. God's uh, covenant with Adam was, don't eat of a certain fruit uh, or you will die, Genesis 2, verse 17. And Adam sinned, he took of that fruit, and as the corporate uh, uh, head of the human race, he brought a curse on himself and a curse on his wife and a curse on the garden and the world itself and a curse on the entire human race which would follow until you and I were born with that same uh, uh, sin nature inside of us. The last book in the Bible, the book of Malachi, or rather in the Old Testament, ends with these words. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's the last word in the Old Testament. Um, the New Testament summarizes the Old Testament system. Notice uh, Galatians chapter 3. 
we'll go there. Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 10. Here's an excellent summary of the life of the Jew in the Old Testament. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Moses told the Israelites, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And, and I've said this before, John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke 1, 6, says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. This is how someone's righteous standing was established. In Nehemiah, the Jews are asking God to curse them if they should break the words of the law or this covenant uh, that they're making to God. The New Testament isn't that way. The New Testament considers uh, every man to already be under a curse. Go, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 3. John 3, notice verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And also verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's already waiting to strike a man down and send a man to hell when he dies because he has not believed on Jesus Christ yet. Of course, that brings up the whole subject, and I hesitate to mention it because people may come in under this Bible study asking me to give more information. We're not going to do that tonight. But it brings up the whole subject about, well, what about people who were never, who, who lived and died before the coming of the Lord Jesus, before the gospel of Christ was ever preached, was ever made available to them, you know, what happens to them? What about people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? And all I can say is read Romans chapter 2, about verses 13, 14, 15, 16, long and there, and see how those without the laws of God will be evaluated and judged by God. In Romans um, eleven thirty two 32 says, For God hath concluded them all, in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Galatians 3, verse 22 says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So the all in Romans 11 that God's going to ha have a mercy on turns out to be those who believe, according to Galatians 3, verse 22. It's not all without any exceptions, but those who believe. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Just as the last book in the Old Testament ends with a curse, look how the last book in the New Testament begins to end. Revelation 22 Revelation 22, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Well, I'm looking forward to that day. That's going to be a wonderful time when we get past this life. The people of the Old Testament entered into a curse. The people in the New Testament enter into Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Um, this oath tonight had three parts to it. It had racial segregation, 
from the nations around them, mentioned there in verse 30. It had Sabbath observance, insisted upon, verse 31, and the support of the ministers or the, of the priesthood uh, in verses 32 to 39, which we'll get to next time.